Cooper, um, for those of you who don't know, is, is a managing partner at Andreessen Horowitz. It's an important distinction. He's the only managing partner uh, at the fund. And I'm going to embarrass him for a minute and say that he was probably one of the most instrumental people in building the fund early. Um, for, you know, from the, they, he had worked with Mark and Ben earlier and kind of behind the scenes helped build up the firm in so many different ways. And we kind of met serendipitously in that when I first moved here, uh, someone introduced me to Scott who was hiring people and he wanted to think that, hey, Simil, you can maybe join the research team. And I thought, hey, I want to work on the investing team. And Scott said, you're not going to be investing here. And uh, <laughs> I was thinking back to that. I meant that in the best of ways. There were, of there were probably, what, 12 people there at the yeah, time? Yeah, so yeah. probably a bad choice on my part. Um, but Scott, thanks for coming here today. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. I thought for a minute, just to set the stage, people know, uh, you know, obviously who Mark, Ben, a lot of the other partners, Chris, one of your newest partners. Yep. Explain how you got involved with the fund, just to set context, yeah. and, and how you've been working to build up the fund over the last six years. Yeah, so uh, as uh, I like to tell people, I've been working with Mark and Ben for going on 17 years now, so it's either a really great job or I'm just a glutton for punishment, one of the two, <laughs> and time will tell uh, what's the case. But I, I first met them when they were starting a company called LoudCloud back in 99, and we were trying to build what is now Amazon Web Services, and we were probably at least 10 years too early, uh, if not more than that. But the basic idea was, gee, why can't cloud essentially be a, a, a utility like electricity? You ought to be able to plug your code into you know, a set of infrastructure, not have to worry about the infrastructure. And so, you know, that business went like this and went like that, and then we ultimately kind of became a software company that we sold to HP. Uh, and so about a year after that, Mark and Ben had been doing angel investing, and they said, gee, you know, we think this would be more interesting to do it on an institutional level and go raise a fund. And uh, I was lucky enough to be able to be part of that, you know, that initial conversation, which has been, you know, a very interesting six and a half years. And so what does it mean to be the only managing partner <laughs> of the so, fund? So it means probably differently than it did when we started. So when we started, the, the job description was, Mark and I are going to go invest. You make sure everything else works, basically, right? So that was basically the job description. It was no more complicated than that. Um, what it means today in practice is we've got about 130 employees. And the way I think about my job is there's kind of three core functions. One is um, what we call our operating functions, which are kind of our post-investment services group. So we have about 80 people who spend time working with portfolio companies and helping them you know, accelerate their growth. So uh, I manage that function. Uh, then there's kind of what I would consider kind of all of the day-to-day uh, administrative functions of the firm, everything from finance and legal to uh, managing investor relations and raising capital for the firm. And then, of course, there's a third piece, which is uh, being on the investment committee and evaluating opportunities and then getting involved with those companies where appropriate. So it's, uh, to me, I think it's, I'm lucky in that it's probably the most fascinating job because, you know, you get to see literally every single facet of the business. Great. So I think, you know, to kick things off, what I thought to do, uh, and, and fair, you know, fair warning to Scott, I gave him the opportunity to suggest some topics, and he said, whatever you want. So he hasn't really filtered, hasn't touched any of these topics. They're all mine. Um, has the firm been, over the last year or two, more active, similar level of activity, or less active on the consumer side? You know, it's been pretty consistent. Um, so if you look at what we do, as you know, we do both consumer and enterprise stuff. Um, and our pace of investing has been pretty consistent over the last two years. Uh, it's been much more uh, early stage oriented probably than later stage oriented. If you looked at just raw number of deals, probably 75, 80% of what we've done over the last two years has been early stage. Um, but the balance between consumer and enterprise, probably not 50-50, but it's, not, it's probably not as lopsided as 25-75 in favor of enterprise. So it's probably somewhere in there, 30, 35% consumer. And over, the, over the last two years of investments on the earlier side, have all of those been announced? Or is the firm doing more stealth investing or more seed investing? Uh, we're, we're still doing seed investing, which we've always done, but we're not doing any of it. There's nothing really stealth. There's a couple of companies who may choose not to publish what they're doing just because they feel like for competitive reason or otherwise, but I wouldn't say, there's no like trend in it at all. It's pretty much, it's been consistent. Right, and now, you know, six going on seven years into the firm, what would you say are the couple of the biggest growing pains that um, you all have had to endure yeah. Right. Coming, coming into the seventh year. Yeah, I think there's a couple things. So on the investment side, 
we all come from having been operators ourselves, right? And so the idea that you have to get used to in the venture capital business, for better or worse, is that you know probably half of what you do is going to end up being a complete failure, right? I mean, you know, the loss ratios vary, but it's probably 40 to 60 percent loss ratios. And you know, that's a hard thing as an operator, right? Because as an operator, you have one thing, you got to do it right, and every quarter, obviously, you, you get a report card as to whether you do it or not. So I'd say one of the growing pains for us is just starting to get to the point where the portfolio is separating, right? And you can see the stuff that's going as you had hoped it would, and there's the stuff that's going okay, and then there are certainly things where you say, you know, it's just they're not going to make it, they're not going to become long-standing companies. And so really thinking hard about resource prioritization and making sure that we are looking at new kind of follow-on investment opportunities critically in, in all those things and making sure that we're spending our time and, and ultimately dollars. Uh, and then probably the other biggest growing pain for us is just, is just literally the growing pain of the firm. So there were three of us six and a half years ago, there's 130 of us now. Uh, and, you know, that's relatively small scale in terms of companies, but, you know, we're doing things that are relatively different. The job descriptions, you know, you know as you let off here, the job we were interviewing for you for at the time, I don't even remember, I don't even know what the job was. I don't think we knew what the job was, quite frankly, right? So a lot of the stuff we're doing for the first time, and so there's just some of those growing pains of saying, okay, we kind of have an idea of what we want to do. We don't really know what the right skill set is. There's no precedent for the job, but let's go try it, and we're going to make mistakes and, you know, quite frankly, just try again. And so as you're one of the things that you mentioned on the operational side is the investment team, the deal teams that you formed. As the fund gets bigger and as you have more partners, how do entrepreneurs smartly get on uh, the Andreessen Horowitz radar if they're not already being pinged by the partners? Because um, I've seen and helped a lot of people and it, it seems a little scattershot sometimes. Um, and it's probably fault on both sides. What's sort of a best practice you've seen about, um, let's say for an entrepreneur in the crowd, the best way to get on, on the radar with someone on the team? Yeah, so I mean, hopefully if we're doing our job right, we're either, we're either finding you or we are making ourselves visible and easily accessible, right? And if, you know, if we're not doing that, then quite frankly, like there's work that we need to be doing. So, um, you know, what I would say is the, the easiest and best way still is if you know anybody who knows someone at the firm, the very fastest and best way is just get someone who knows somebody at the firm to send us an email, and you know, we, I think we have a pretty good process for how to do that. Um, it's much harder when you send cold emails in just because I think it's just human nature, right, which is, look, we all get bombarded by email, and it's very hard to actually process that stuff, but we try to make ourselves accessible. We try to do things like blog posts and other stuff that kind of, you know, help give people a sense of what we think about and why we think about it, and so hopefully those things, you know, uh, you know are sufficient to actually help people feel comfortable that they kind of know somebody even though they may not actually yet know them personally. Right, so ju just to make sure I've gotten that point is that if somebody um, wants to pitch or get in front of you, you and your partners, yeah. Find somebody who works at the firm, get get a warm introduction from yeah. that person. Yeah, I mean, that's the best thing to do. I mean, look, you can also send it to me too, and you know, I'm pretty efficient with my email, yeah. Yeah. but it's it's just, it, look, it's a, natural, it's a natural human instinct, which is if you send me something, like I, I, I know that you've done some screen on it, that you've, you've looked at it, and that just makes life more efficient, but if you, if you don't have that, then yes, there are things that get done out of cold email, but it's just, it's just hard, yeah. to be honest. And, and so sitting at the, let's say, Series A and B level yeah. where and Dreesen Horowitz says, over the last couple of years, we've heard a lot of stats today about um, explosion in, in sort of seed funds, micro funds, more money coming into the asset class through crowdfunding, yep. corporate money, sovereign money. Um, how, how has a partnership managed to deal with the influx of companies that are coming in? Yeah. So the good news is, right, is to your point, because particularly of how much the seed, seed market has grown, the pipeline of stuff coming into the early stage A market is as big probably as it's ever been. So there's probably 3,000, 4,000 actual opportunities, right, that might come through the funnel. Um, you know, we look at them first. There's a lot of stuff that we can easily eliminate, quite frankly, just because it's stuff that we don't do, right? It might be, you know, we don't do clean tech investments, for example, or we don't do traditional biotech investments. And so there's easy, there's easy first level screens where probably you can eliminate close to about 50% of what comes in at the top of the funnel just because it's not an area that we spend time in. But what we try to do after that is we try to triage everything so that, like, you know, a live person actually looks at it, and sometimes they'll go back to the entrepreneur and ask follow-up questions. Uh, sometimes they'll say, hey, like, this is, I know enough now to actually call you in and take a meeting. But what we're trying to do is we want to be respectful of people's time and not drag people in and, you know, take an hour of their time just to find out stuff that we could have learned by looking at the deck and deciding if it was interesting or not. But we try to be, we try to be as efficient as possible. The good news is, as you mentioned, is the number of opportunities is just great. And that's a, I think that's a great thing, both in terms of the experimentation that the seed 
investing provides, but also kind of it means that there's a lot of opportunities to look at at the early stage. So is there, would you say there's too much money at seed or that the Series A firms can benefit from that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's too much or not. So you remember, you know these numbers, but if you think about it in context, the total seed capital is still less than 5% of all venture capital dollars. Now, we know from a fund perspective, right, from firms, that's where all the growth has been. So there's probably, I don't know whose numbers are right, but there's probably somewhere between 250, 300 firms that have less than $100 million assets under management. I think the big thing that's changed is you went from a market that was completely non-institutional. It was people like Ron Conway, it was people like Paul Graham, it was people like Mark Andreessen before he started the firm, who were literally writing checks out of their own checkbooks. And then starting in probably 2005, 2006 is when you saw this institutionalization. So I don't know if there's too much money there. It certainly feels, if you look qualitatively at the data, that the seed market probably peaked late 2012, first half of 2013. And I think that's not that shocking because I think that was right, you know, kind of after the Facebook IPO. You had kind of a series of consumer IPOs, right? Groupon and Zynga in 2011 and then Facebook in April of 2012 that at least at the time performed, you know, less than what people had expected. Now, obviously, Facebook has gone on certainly to perform incredibly well. But I think that kind of put a little bit of a chill on the seed market because most of, most of the seed market was consumer. I, I, would, I don't know the numbers, but I would guess 85, 90% of seed stuff is consumer as opposed to enterprise. And, you know, back in 2012, 2013, I think is also, you saw the peak of valuation caps at, you know, things like $20 million caps. So it feels to be qualitatively like the market has come off a little bit, uh, not in a bad way, but just I think, you know, volumes are more normalized, valuations are still very healthy, but, you know, kind of there's more eight, 10, $12 million notes as opposed to $20 million notes. So I, I, it's, I think it's hard to say it's overfunded given that it's such a relatively small portion of the business. Great. And then what, what about for, for folks who, who do get seed funding and then maybe do a second seed, a seed extension, a yeah. bridge, whatever <laughs> you want to call it, is it, um, are they looked upon differently when they reach the desk of Andreessen Horowitz? Yeah. Is it something that entrepreneurs should um, think critically about or is it, hey, just charge ahead and yeah. finance a business any way that you can? I think that's a lot of what people are here to figure yeah. out is that the seed funding was relatively easy over the last four or five years. What do we do next? Is it time to sell? Is it time to extend yeah. the runway? Is it time to cut costs? Yeah, so look, I think um, if, if you're still passionate about the business and the business is still what you think it can be, it, like, you know, I'm certainly no, but I'm not, and I'm not in any position to tell you to stop chasing your dream. What I, what I will say that we see is, I do think that's a big, that's a big change, you know, again, from five or seven years ago, this concept of kind of multiple seeds or seed extensions, whatever we want to call them. And I'll tell you the biggest thing that we find, which can be challenging, and I think it's probably challenging for most of the institutional, you know, kind of venture community who's not doing seed, but who's putting most of their money into A or B or other rounds is, um, often what happens is the cap table gets to a point where it can be challenging for new money to come in, right? Because I think what people underestimate is you take a note and it sounds great, uh, but you keep kind of adding things onto that note, and before you know it, you've sold 25, 30, 35% of the company. It, it starts to add up pretty quickly. And then I think what an institutional VC has a little bit of challenge of is to say, okay, look, I'm going to come in, I'm going to put $5 million, I'm going to put $7 million in, I want to own 25, 30% of the company because that's the way the business model works for institutional VCs. And you couple that with the dilution that the founders have already taken, and all of a sudden you look at it and you say, gee, you know, two, two years into this company, the, 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 guy, the, the founding team has been pretty well diluted, and we either need to address that now and go think about option re-ups now, or we're potentially creating a problem down the line where the amount of equity, you know, uh, participation for founders is have, materially have different. Have you seen deals that were possible to get through fall apart based on that reason? Yeah, we've definitely, we've definitely seen some, you know, I'd say it's still a minority of deals, so it's not, it's not a majority of deals, but we definitely see things where, you know, you just get to the point where you feel like the, the amount of dilution relative to the progress of the company is not going to be sufficient to account for dilution that is likely to come down the road. And as an, as an early investor, you worry either, do I have a disincented management team now who, you know, feels like they already have given away too much of the company, or will I be able to raise additional capital down the line when another new investor comes in and says, hey, this cap table just doesn't work for me. I'm only going to do this deal if you re-up, you know, the option pool by, you know, some significant amount of money to effectively accommodate for the fact that the dilution was significant and is, in early is rounds. Is there any company that's now reached a point where it's safe to discuss that came in that did that the right way that could be an example for people to look at? I don't know if there's a, I don't know if there's a right way. I guess to me, um, the the... If you get to the point where right, there's no magic numbers, but if you're starting to sell 20, 25, 30% of the company and you still haven't gotten to your first institutional seat of financing, 
I think it can be, you know, you're starting to get to the point where it's not, you're not, it's not, you're not over the line yet, but it's getting to the point where I think people are going to look at it more carefully. So we've done, we had one deal that we actually did where we felt like the cap table needed to be cleaned up at the time of that first round, and what we needed to do was actually do a re-up of option grants to the founding team to, to kind of account for the fact that they had diluted themselves earlier. And those are hard conversations because obviously that means you're potentially diluting the other investors who, you know, who seeded the company. So it's not, it's not a desirable place to be, but sometimes, you know, that is, that is uh, you know, what it takes if you feel like you've got no point where you need to address that. Okay. Um, and another thing you mentioned, um, just to change gears slightly, yeah. at, at the beginning of our talk about one of, one of the three things that you focus on, uh, the, the services for the yep. portfolio. Um, and, and Paul Martino, when he, when he kicked off the session today with John Doerr, talked about this opera the operation side of VC or yep. adding value add services. I think you all have been a pioneer in, in thinking about how to how to do that at a on a platform level. What does it mean to be a platform at the series A and B level to you? And then do you do you think it also makes sense for earlier micro funds also to become platforms? So for us, um, the reason we did it for a couple reasons. Number one was clearly we were a new entrant in the space and we felt look you know, if you're going to break into a space just like any other company, you've got to have some, some competitive differentiation from everything else that's out there, right? There are phenomenal firms who've been in this industry for a long time, quite frankly, you know, who uh, pre-existed us. And uh, we felt, look, if we're going to go try to break in, we have to, we have to actually have a message to the entrepreneurial community that is attractive to them and that makes them say, hey, look, we're willing to take a chance on a firm that doesn't have a 30, 40 year track record because we think there's something else of value that differentiates them. Um, you know, that was certainly, you know, part and parcel of what we did. The other thing was, you know, it's a little bit of uh, part of the ethos of the firm that we are, um, we tend to like technical founders. And that doesn't mean that you have to, everyone has to be a computer science major, but we like people who are, we like the product visionary to also be part of the founding team and in many cases be the CEO of the company uh, if they can ultimately grow into the long-term CEO. And one of the things that at least we observed is, is those those people may number one by definition be first time CEOs because you know a lot of them will you know be doing this for the first time, and secondly they may not have developed all the other skill sets that you need to be a well rounded CEO right they may not know how to hire a sales team they may not know or how to hire a CFO. Did we lose somebody there? <laughs> oh, is your? I think your mic's on. I think my mic's on. Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay. Sorry. Continue. Didn't mean to interrupt that conversation. <laughs> um, so. The, uh, so the other idea behind the services team was, look, if we, if we take a first-time founder who's a technical person who may not have done some of their skills, are there things we can surround them with that help them kind of grow into the CEO job by accelerating the development of their skill set around some of these other areas, right? So if we can say, hey, we can help you, you know, meet your first five or ten enterprise customers, that has value to us, it has value to our LPs, it ought to have value to our companies, and it also helps them kind of, you know, develop a broader skill set that hopefully makes them the long-term CEO and for, for the a company. larger fund like you all have, have grown into, there's a real pitch to the LP about how the fee dollars yeah, are going right. to be used. So, well, yeah. so how would that translate to, let's say, a lot of these 300, you know, sub $100 million funds that maybe don't have the fee structure yeah. to do it? What have you seen? Have you seen any interesting examples do you think it even works at seed, that yep. people should try it? Yeah, look, so uh, you're right, which is the, the trade-off we've made with our LPs is we've said, look, we are taking your management fees and we're going to use them, but we're going to use them obviously to pay for this, what we think creates long-term asset value for the firm. Um, now, we have that luxury, obviously, because we do have, you know, that stream of, of fees and, and, you know, obviously we shouldn't, we shouldn't you know, pretend otherwise. Um, you know, I've seen, you know, what, what I've seen at least externally, I don't know it internally, but, you know, guys like First Round, for example, I think have done very good things where they've done kind of more of, you know, I would say more of the virtual piece of what we've done. And I don't mean virtual in a negative way at all. I think they've done a very good job on it where, whether it's the, in the form of mailing lists or it's in the form of, you know, kind of user groups and stuff like that. And so by no means, like, is what we've done kind of the end all be all and, and you know, sure. and no one else can do it. We chose to do it a certain way, partly because we did have the flexibility to do it and we think there's value there, but I do think there are other ways to do it even if you have the constraint of a lower fee stream through some of these other, you know, tool-based systems that people have developed. Got it. Um, so one, one kind of more geography question. I think a few years ago, Mark said publicly that the firm would always be on Sand Hill Road, <laughs> would resist the temptation to have a San Francisco outpost I think in the last couple of years, a lot, even more of the larger yeah. Sand Hill funds have uh, created an outpost quietly. 
in the city. Should we be expecting something like that <laughs> from you all? Well, uh, I don't. Uh, I won't speak for Mark. Uh, I guess you know it's always it's always good to never say never in this business. Um, we're, we we might be one of the last dinosaurs uh, on Sand Hill, and you know maybe that means rents will actually go down, and therefore it'll be cheaper to be in Sand Hill than it is in the city today, uh, which may be a positive implication of that. But look, there's no question, and no more serious level, there's no question that the 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 vast majority of portfolio companies are here. I mean, if I look at our portfolio. You know, I would, I would imagine 75 plus percent of our companies in the Bay Area are San Francisco based as opposed to kind of Palo Alto or South. And, you know, that wouldn't have been the case even 10 years ago. So, you know, whether we have an office here or not, we're obviously spending a lot of time, you know, commuting back and forth. The issue for us about an office is less about San Francisco versus somewhere else. It's more about just the culture of the firm and do you want to start to split the firm and say, look, there's people in San Francisco and people in Menlo Park and what does that do to communication? What does that do to kind of how people actually interact? And partly because we've got a people intensive business, we're just quite frankly, you know, we're nervous about potentially going down that path, uh, less so about San Francisco again, but just more so generally about actually thinking about splitting the firm. Great. Yeah, so I just want to um, just say that we're going to have mics on, on either side of the, um, the audience here if people have questions for Scott. I want to see how much time we have left. Uh, oh, oh, great. Yeah, okay. Okay. So if you, if you have questions lined up, we'll do kind of 10 minutes of questions. But um, so let's see. So I think a couple years ago, uh, one of the, one of, I can't remember who, but one of the partners at, an, uh, at the firm kind of had a throwaway line, enterprise A, consumer B. <laughs> um, does that still hold true? Yeah, somebody said that, and it created lots of excitement in the, uh, <laughs> uh, in the ethos. So l let me see if I can explain what we, what we intended by that, right, as, as opposed to this, which is um, when, when uh, we, do, we do both enterprise and consumer stuff, uh, when we're doing, you know, let's call it a very, very early stage enterprise company, what we were trying to distinguish between is how much diligence can you do at different stages and how comfortable can you get in, in terms of what you can de-risk in the company, right? And so, at least on the enterprise side, we said, gee, even at the very early stage, you can kind of sit down with the engineers and say, okay, can they build what they're proposing to build? Do I think that's actually, you know, engineering wise and, and mathematically feasible to build? And, you know, you can get yourself pretty comfortable at least within some margin of error that those guys can actually do what they're saying they're gonna do. And then you also have the ability to, in not all cases, but in many cases, be able to go to existing enterprise customers and say, if somebody were to build something that looked like this and had these features, does that have value to you as a company? Now, you, you can't do full price discovery, but you can at least de-risk the idea of does the market, does, does a potential market exist for what these, these, these teams are proposing to build? And so from a diligence perspective, at least you could get yourself more comfortable even at a very early stage. On the consumer side, um, you know, it's not, this is not universally true, but uh, it is often the case that you really don't get to see any real kind of cohort data until something's been in market for a more demonstrable period of time, right? Where you can kind of say, okay, here's the people who joined in January. What's their degradation What's curve it, look like? How, how would you define a demonstrable period of time? Is it six months worth of cohort data, a year's worth? Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's six months-ish or something. I don't think it needs to be years, and I don't think it needs to be in 50 markets or anything. I think it can be in one market. The whole idea is, what can you de-risk, right? So can I de-risk the idea that there are customers who say, this is a valuable product, I engage with it with some, you know, uh, like noticeable level of engagement, you know, in terms of either, you know, you know, daily active use or weekly active use, and what do the degradation curves look like, right? So, you know, when somebody joins in January, how likely are they still to be using the service in June, for example? And then can I look over time with the cohorts and say, okay, gee, the cohorts that are joining later actually seem to have even better engagement, right? Which suggests that you're starting to at least, you're not really building a network effect, but you're building at least some kind of strength in the, in the value of what you're building that kind of increases potentially with the number of users on the system. So if you can at least de-risk that, then, we, then, you know, as a venture capitalist, you can say, okay, I think this has value. I don't know if these people can roll it out in 50 different markets, but I'm willing to take that bet for maybe the A round, for example. And then maybe at the B round, I'm willing to take you know, another 10 markets bet. And then maybe at the C round, I'm willing to take the bet, can they then actually show monetization against that? Um, and so to go back to your earlier question, the whole kind of idea behind that very, very simple phrasing was, um, you know, it's a question of how much, how much de-risking can you do at what stage? And it was a very crass, you know, just way to think about it, which is, and it's not always true, but, you know, oftentimes you can de-risk an enterprise product potentially at an earlier stage than you can de-risk a consumer product. And so if you're thinking about that on a risk award basis, you know, you might be willing to say, okay, we'll wait, we might invest at different stages based upon that. Got it, got but it. those are all heuristics, and you know, probably the one thing that we've learned in this business is every heuristic is meant to be broken, and uh, you know, they're there purely for sake of argument. And, and so on that line of thinking, I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit now. That's good. I'm reaching the end of my list, but <laughs> going back to geography, 
Um, and you think about more and more people around the world coming online, coming into entrepreneurship, um, markets flattening. Yeah. Um, I think maybe one of the few international investments your firm has made is TransferWise. Yeah, and Improbable, too. And Improbable, yep. both yep. in the UK? Yep, both in the UK. Yeah. So could we see more of that in different continents? Is that something that um, the partnership has discussed? Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. It's something that we have discussed, and it's something that we rediscuss a lot. Um, and again, I'd put this in the category of never saying never, but for right now, there are no, there's no plans to do anything substantive from a external, from a non North America, U.S. perspective, and part of that is, um, and that's not a normative statement as to whether Europe or China or India are great places. Uh, you know, I, I believe they are, and, and certainly we're not ones to judge that because we certainly don't have any presence in those areas. Um, it's really kind of two issues for us. One is, um, as a firm. We're still relatively new, and as we've talked about, we've got a few moving parts, right? We've got this whole operational services group. It's a different kind of formulation than people have seen previously in venture capital. And what's not clear yet, and, and we're not really ready to test it, is how well does that scale into different geographies, right? So if we were to go to China or India, do we need to replicate the whole operational services team? Do we just have, you know, outposts there? And is that a stable feature? Is that stable long term, or does that introduce risk in terms of whether people feel like they're really part of the mothership or not? So that's kind of thing number one. And thing number two is just more, you know, I, I guess I'd call it strategic, which is as a young firm, uh, we'd rather just, you know, we'd rather focus our efforts and say we think Silicon Valley, North America, is a pretty broad space to invest in, anyways, and. If we could increase market share in those markets, that's probably a better way to kind of you know deploy every marginal dollar of cost than to say, hey, let's actually distribute ourselves across multiple markets. Mm -hmm. So I would view the UK stuff as less us saying, hey, we're going to go you know make a serious effort in the UK, and more an issue of there are people we knew and teams we got to know, and we thought the opportunities were really interesting. And they and just so, happen to be in England. Yeah, they happen to be in, in the UK, but like you know, uh, that wasn't there was no kind of strategy which said let's go find companies in the UK in which to invest. Okay, so sticking on this theme of never yeah. say never, um, you just uh, recruited a Stanford professor, life scientist, yeah. uh, to run uh, a special fund intersection of computer science and life sciences. Correct. How, how did the partnership come to that strategic decision? versus saying, no, we don't want to do clean tech now? Yeah. Or how, do, how are those decisions made? Yeah, so uh, let me just, so just to set the stage for everybody, so we announced uh, two weeks ago, right before Thanksgiving, that we raised a $200 million fund. As um, uh, Simul said, we added a uh, person named Vijay uh, Panda to the team, uh, who's a former Stanford professor in kind of, you know, uh, biochemistry and, and uh, you know, computational biology. And the thinking behind it was, um, as you know, like the theme of the, so of the firm has always been this concept of software as in the world, right? Mark wrote this op-ed now six and a half years ago almost in the Wall Street Journal with the basic concept that, hey, software is permeating many more traditional industries, you know, Netflix in the video industry, Apple iTunes in the music industry, Airbnb, all this other stuff, right? And one of the things that we started seeing probably starting about 18 to 24 months ago was this idea of software permeating more of uh, life sciences and particularly permeating kind of biology and how people think about both diagnostics and potential delivery of care. And we didn't have anybody on our team who we thought was sufficiently well versed to be able to kind of de-risk the biology side of these things even though they were, you know, they were software companies but we had to also really understand the biology side. And so as we spent some time looking at these opportunities we just got more and more convinced of what the size of this opportunity could be. Um, and that's not to say, obviously, clean tech is a huge opportunity as well. Our view was, though, what, what got us convinced on this was that we felt like these were fundamentally, we were seeing more kind of software-based teams with also combinations of people who had bio backgrounds, but trying to take a more software-based approach to these businesses, as opposed to what I would consider traditional biotech or traditional medical device, which are, you know, perfectly good investments in their own right, but just not, those are, those are less kind of pure software-led. Um, the other thing that, you know, got us really convicted here is, you know, as, you, as everyone here knows, of course, you've always had Moore's Law benefits, you know, in the computer industry in terms of, you know, cost of servers and cost of storage and cost of bandwidth, you know, 10, 100x factors of cost. You know, the cost of genomics now has finally really dramatically started to come down from, you know, you know, tens of millions of dollars to sequence the genome when we first started to, you can do it now for COGS that are probably $300, $350, and presumably you'll be able to get that down below $100 uh, over time. And so you've got kind of these 
combinatorial things happening, which is compute power getting greater, the cost of compute declining, things like machine and machine learning, you know, kind of uh, you know uh, deep learning really dramatically getting to a point where it makes sense. You've also got cost curves on the bio side coming down. And so to us, it looked a lot like what software looked like, you know, even, you know, 15, 20 years ago uh, as a real platform shift. And so that's what got us excited about it. And we found the person that we thought was the perfect match between software and life sciences. And, and quite frankly, just, you know, went to our existing LPs and said, here's why we think this is a compelling opportunity. Um, and so I think we're going to turn to questions. Think about your questions. Got five more minutes before we run to there. Um, let's say if we dial the clock back to August, September time, yeah. there was a few gyrations in the stock market yeah. and then a lot of investors I talked to up and down the stack feel like something has shifted. We've heard a lot of that today. Yeah. What's your just personal view on how the market has potentially shifted um, and especially if you were an entrepreneur starting a company today? How would you think about it today versus just even six months ago? Yeah. So I think it. Uh, I, I think I think it varies a little bit by stage, but I, I agree there's been some changes. I would almost. I, I think you could even post date it maybe as far back as last summer uh, when you had the Zendesk IPO. I think was kind of the first time Zendesk, at least I think, was the first meaningful, well-known IPO that kind of price ended up pricing well below where the last round of private financing was. And then, as you know, kind of end of last year, we had Hortonworks and New Relic, and then you had Box at the beginning of this year. You had Pure Storage fairly recently, so and obviously, uh, you know, um, Square. So you know, there's been now at least more than you know, it's more than one, which may, maybe is not a full pattern yet, but there's certainly more than you know, just an anomaly of some of these companies pricing at at valuations that are lower. So I think a couple things have happened. I think one is um, it is the case of the later stages that if you talk to the main buyers there, at least based on our conversations. The buyers are still there. They're still very interested, and that's mainly because of broader structural issues around, you know, dearth of growth opportunities in the public markets. I think the buyers are there. There's no doubt that deals are, you know, deals that would have gotten done very quickly six months ago are probably taking a little bit longer to get done. They're probably getting done, you know, at lower valuations. It's hard to really quantify it, but if you look at the public market comps, public market comps are probably off 20% from the beginning of the year, so it wouldn't be surprising to me if that's reflected in what's happening in the later stage. Um, and then um, the other big thing is if you talk to the public market investors is they say, look, there was a time where we were very happy with 75 to 100 percent top line growth. And it was OK if you could achieve that growth to have very significant cash burn associated with that and to not yet be showing real meaningful operating leverage in the financial model. I think if you talk to them today, what they'll say is, look, we still want growth, but kind of, you know, 50 ish percent growth is pretty good and we're pretty happy with that. If you can show 50 percent growth with a little bit more, you know, kind of, you know, Getting, you don't need to be cash flow positive, but with a path towards getting to cash flow positive and with showing something on the P&L that suggests that you're starting to get some operating leverage in the business, we probably will value that highly today. Then we will value the 75 plus percent grower who's still consuming a significant amount of cash. And so I think that is a little bit of a shift in the mindset of the public market investors about how they look at some of these companies. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think on other stages, if you, you know, to your question, which is if you're starting a company today, I'm not sure that any of this really matters that much, right? Uh, in part because you're talking about exit environments that might be 7, 10, 12 years out. Um, yes, it may be that at the outset, maybe, you know, you, you slightly, you don't grow quite as fast because you're a little bit more concerned about cash conservation, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it's hugely material. Um, but I do think it, you have to be aware of it and you have to be sensitive to the fact that incentives change, environments change, and there may be a time in your life where people say, hey, growth at all costs is not as valuable at, as growth at some reasonable cost, and you have to be willing to at least listen to those tea leaves and, and adjust accordingly. Okay, great. Well, I hope we have some, I can't see because of the lights, but I, hopefully we have some people lined up for questions. Uh, if there's someone on the, yeah, I oh, see yeah, there you. Okay, Sorry. there we go. Hey, Scott. Um, so one of the trends in, in venture in the last few years, and I know Samuel has tweeted about this a little bit, is uh, IRR has been great, cash on cash has been negative. Um, yeah. And, you know, with, with the dearth of IPOs and the really strong private financing market, there's obviously uh, you know, less of a reason to go public, but it seems to be that there's this impending liquidity crunch where there's just not enough money being pumped back into the system. And I wonder how, like, how concerning is that? I mean, you, you know, the returns look great, but at some point, don't you have to start getting yeah. cash to you know, return to your investors who then would pump money back into funds? And yeah. Just how, how do you think about that? Yeah, so uh, I agree with the second part of your question. I, I'll, I want to take issue a little bit with the first part of the premise, which is um, if you actually look at, if you actually look at uh, people who have you know, venture portfolios that are more than basically five years old, so kind of a more mature venture portfolio, if you look from 2012 onward, 
they're actually cash flow positive for literally almost every, if you talk to any institutional investor, they'll tell you they're cash flow positive, meaning they're getting more money back than they're putting in in terms of capital calls. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't ignore your broader question, which is that there is a significant difference between realized gains on the, on the books and unrealized gains, and a lot of that unrealized clearly, obviously by definition, is illiquid at this point in time. But just to be very clear though, it is the case that if you've got a mature venture portfolio and a, and a broader buyout portfolio, you're actually not cash flow negative, you're actually cash flow positive, but that's a function of having you know, mature vintages that are throwing off cash at the same time your capital calls are uh, more moderate. Um, I think the broader question is a real good question, and I think um, if you look at the numbers right, so 11 years to IPO for the 2014 class of IPO, that over a 35-year period, that was about seven and a half years, if you go back to 1980 to 2015, about seven and a half years was the average time to IPO, so from seven and a half to 11 is pretty demonstrable, and if you look at it from 2001 to 2014, it's about 10 years, so it's not just 2011, it's literally been a demonstrable trend over the last 14 years. Um, and I do think it's a, real, uh, it's a real open question for the industry as to, because uh, I don't think what's going to happen is, I don't think investors are just going to say, great, you know, let's change the term from 10-year terms of these partnership agreements to 20-year terms. There may be some who are willing to do that if you can demonstrate that the actual cash on cash return is better. I think more likely what happens is, um, I think if this trend continues, you will likely see the development of a more fully formed secondary market. Um, you know, there's signs of this today in the employee side of things, right, which is uh, there are companies who are doing kind of partial tender offers for employees and providing some liquidity for employees for companies that haven't gone public in a long time. Uh, today, you don't see many investors at all participating in that. I suspect, you know, over the next five years, if these trends continue, you will have also a secondary market where you might have early stage venture investors who might sell to some of the people who are later stage investors today and just to have a different time horizon, a different kind of return threshold, and that may be how you alleviate some of the kind of liquidity bottleneck in the industry. Okay, we have one more minute for question over here. Uh, yeah, uh, if you had to force rank the importance of team, product, and traction, how would you rank them and why? Um, so it, it spends a little bit on stage, but if you're talking early stage, uh, I would put team by far at the highest and by a wide margin. And, and the reason why is because um, it's almost always the case that the product, at least in large, it, to a certain extent, and then certainly the business plan that you think you're going to execute at an early stage will bear no resemblance to the plan you actually end up executing, and that could change many times. And so the question really that we're betting on is, what is it about this team that makes them uniquely qualified to go after this space generally with an idea they have today, but maybe that idea morphs over time? And then also, what is it about this team that allows them to attract employees, to raise money, to be able to effectively build a company? And all those things, you know, will change around what the product direction may be or what the market may look like. But ultimately, you know, uh, people don't change. And so the question that the, the large part of that investment thesis is really on people. What about at the later stage? Yeah, later stage, um, you know, the people still matter. But at that point in time, you ought to actually have something else to validate those other questions, right? You ought to be able to validate the market based on numbers. You ought to be able to validate, does the product actually, you know, is there product market fit? So it's not that team isn't important, but I'd say the delta in importance starts to shrink because you actually have demonstrable data against which you can actually test a real hypothesis at that point in time. So you just get more data, which you don't have at the early stage. And so at the early stage, the only thing you can really evaluate is, is the team. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Scott. All right. Thank you. Thank you.